Hey everyone, thanks for clicking on the link to this video. So here we're talking about the Rule 5 draft and what that potentially could mean for the Boston Red Sox heading into the 2025 season. The Rule 5 draft is just two days away and today is the final day for them to protect players before they head into that draft. I think there's a lot of pretty interesting things to talk about with this, so let's just get into it. So really quickly here, for those of you that don't know, the Rule 5 draft is a draft that's in place to protect minor league players that have already been drafted from being kind of forgotten in a team's minor league system. Basically what that means is a player that is first signed at 18 years or younger must be added to a team's 40-man roster spot within five seasons or become eligible for this draft. Players that are drafted at 19 years or older have to be protected within four seasons or the same thing can happen. If clubs select a player, they basically pay $100,000 to their team, they get to take that player, and they have to keep them on their active 26-man roster the entire season. Now, if a player gets hurt and they're on the injured list for a significant period of time, as long as they're on the major league injured list, that still qualifies for the 26-man roster spot. But if they are no longer on their 26-man roster, they can be offered back to their former team for $50,000. Now, the caveat to that is, obviously, if a team wants that player back, they have to keep them on their 40-man roster spot as well. They can't just take them back and put them back off of the 40-man roster. They have to leave them on that roster spot. So there's a little bit of game of chess when it kind of comes to this, but I would say... a a lot of players that do get selected, they end up staying on the roster all season long. Now, there are actually quite a few good players that are drafted in the Rule 5 draft. And in fact, Garrett Whitlock was somebody who was drafted from the Yankees about three seasons ago in the Rule 5 draft. And he's been one of the mainstays on the Red Sox pitching staff when he hasn't been hurt <laughs> the past three seasons. Another player who was selected just this last year was Justin Slayton. And he was maybe the best reliever the Red Sox had all of last year. In my personal opinion, when pitchers get drafted in the Rule 5 draft, you never know quite what you're going to get from that. Pitchers are pretty volatile, and honestly, sometimes a new organization can just kind of tweak them, and as long as they have the right stuff, they can be a really good player. Like, we just saw that with Justin Slayton, obviously. So there is good reason to take this seriously, because they can be important pieces moving forward. So every year, teams have a ton of players to kind of go through and select who they want to protect from this Rule 5 draft. Now, most of these players, they're not really candidates to be selected. And I would say that 90% of the players that are on the Rule 5 draft for the Red Sox this season, they're not really options to be protected either. But there are those handful of players where you have to make that decision. Do you want to protect them? Do you want to risk losing them in the draft? Or are they somebody who could be contributing at the major league level very soon? There's a lot of pros and cons that you have to weigh when you select certain players onto the roster. And so we'll jump into those with the Red Sox right now. So one thing that is very important when it comes to the Rule 5 draft this next season is the Red Sox 40-man roster is already completely full. Now, last season, the Red Sox were heading into the Rule 5 draft, and they had a couple spots available, basically because they knew they were going to add certain players to the roster. They, I think Wickelman Gonzalez was one of the players that was added, and Luis Perales was another one that was added. So there were guys they wanted to protect from that Rule 5 draft this last year. This year, they, I'm sure they have some players that they want to protect, but the roster's full, which essentially means that if you want to protect somebody, you're going to have to lose somebody from this 40-man roster spot, and that means designating them for assignment, which means any team can pick them up if they want to, essentially for free in a similar manner to they would with this Rule 5 draft. Now, there are some guys that are on this 40-man roster, especially on the pitching side, that I would expect are a little bit more expendable when it comes to the current roster and the future roster for the Red Sox. One of those guys that I think could potentially be on that list is Bailey Horn. Bailey just really hasn't performed very well at the major league level so far. As you can see, 18 innings pitched, 6.5 ERA. Um, he gives up a lot of walks. He doesn't strike out a lot of batters, and he's giving up a lot of hits. This is a very bad combination. And when you look at his minor league numbers, they're not jumping off the page either. He essentially is kind of like a fill-in player on this 40-man roster spot. And unless he can kind of turn it around here in the next couple of seasons... Um, there's a very real possibility that this taste of Major League Baseball that he got this season potentially could be his only taste of Major League Baseball ever. I would very much expect him to not be on the 40-man roster heading to this next season. Another player that I think is very likely that could be designated for assignment from this 40-man roster right now is Chase Sugart. Um, Chase did okay this last season for the Red Sox. He had six games that he came into, um, pitched all right, 4.15 ERA. But at the end of the day, you still kind of look at his numbers here. And he did strike out a decent amount of players in the minors this last season, but he doesn't have a strong track record of doing that. 
and his ERA isn't great, his whip's not great, he gives up too many walks, um, he gives up a decent amount of hits, and so, like, he's one of those guys that, especially heading into his age 28 season, yes, he is somebody who performed okay this last year, but he's really one of those guys that, if he gets designated for assignment, kind of similar to Bailey Horn, it's going to be tough road to him getting back onto a major league roster, at least right away. Now, these guys definitely could get selected by another team when they're designated for assignment, but I just, I don't imagine that to be the case. They're probably somebody that gets designated for assignment, they get outrighted down to AAA, or they could elect for free agency, but I doubt that they would do that. Those are probably the two most obvious names on this list that I think could get designated for assignment. There are some other ones that potentially could. You know, Emmanuel Valdez is even one of those names that potentially could on the, the offensive side. He's probably the only position player that I think would even have a shot at getting designated for assignment. Isaiah Campbell, potentially. Brian Mata is another interesting name that maybe could be, but I, I think that they've been trying to hang on to him for a while to just see if they can fix him as much as possible. But overall, that'll kind of just leave us with two spots on this roster that potentially could be filled by active players. So I'm on StocksProspects.com here, and they have a comprehensive list of every player that's available for the Rule 5 draft. Now, like I said before, this is a lot of players that potentially could be eligible for this draft. And like I said before, I don't think most of these players are even a candidate to be selected for the Rule 5 draft or to be protected. So let's jump into a little bit of a smaller list here. That way you can actually see who potentially could be picked and we can talk through those guys. So out of the Red Sox top 30 prospects, they currently have five of them that are eligible for the Rule 5 draft this year. This is a really good place to start when it comes to the Rule 5 draft, just because more often than not, prospects that are going to be protected from the draft are going to be, you know, higher rated prospects or more likely those that are MLB ready. That's really what it is. So the first one on this list will go from bottom to the top, Blaze Jordan. Blaze Jordan was drafted in the third round in 2020 by Boston, and He's kind of had a roller coaster of a time within the organization so far. So if you look at his stats down here, he had a really nice 2022-2023 season, put up some really nice numbers. But one of the things that was his calling card in the beginning was his power. And he really hasn't shown that very much in the minor leagues. He did all right last year. I mean, you know, 533 slugging percentage, 918 OPS. That's pretty good, but... He kind of had some like inflated numbers when it came from that. And this last season, when he got promoted to Portland and, and part of last year as well, when he was in Portland, he really hasn't been able to carry over some of that power. And so since then, we are, we're trying to protect guys that potentially could get picked by organizations. Because remember, these guys have to stay on the active roster for the full calendar year or else they can be offered back to their original team. Now, if you're a team, are you going to be picking up Blaze Jordan, who's, you know, played in a full season at Portland and he's batting like 255 with a, you know, 700 OPS? No, I, I don't think so. He's 21 years old. I think he needs another like full season to see what you got, because at the end of this year, he can be eligible for the Rule 5 draft again. This happens every single year. It just kind of rolls over and over and over again until somebody actually ends up drafting him potentially or they add him to the 40-man roster the Red Sox do. I think this year, he's he's just, there's, there's no reason to protect him whatsoever. There's a 0% chance in my mind that he actually ends up getting protected here because he's not going to get picked. All right, the next guy up is Jordani Manegro. He's a right-handed pitcher for the Red Sox. He's 22 years old. And something that was super interesting about this guy is he was signed in 2020 as an international free agent, but he was signed for $35,000. This guy was signed for like nothing. Like basically this guy was like a fill-in guy that they picked when they were using international free agent money. And he's kind of developed into a pretty good starting pitcher. Like if you look at this last season, 14 starts, 2.73 ERA, 66 innings pitched, 82 strikeouts, 11.18 K per nine. 1.03 whip. These are really, really good numbers. This is the type of stuff that you want to see as a progression from a young player. But again, if you look at this season, he only played at single A Salem, like high A Salem. And so when you're trying to pick players, he has to spend the whole year on another team's active roster. He's not ready at not even close. You can't take a guy who's in high A and put him on the major league roster for a full season, even if you do have impressive numbers like these. And to be perfectly honest, this type of guy right here, I think Manegro, you look at him at the end of this next season, and he probably is going to start the year in double A. There's a very real chance that he ends up in triple A by the end of the season. And then you look at next year's Rule 5 draft, and I think that becomes really interesting. 
because he could make his major league debut potentially in the 2026 season. And so I think he's somebody that you might look to protect at that point. But he's one of the most exciting pitching prospects in the organization. But again, just not ready yet. Next one up, we're going to have Hunter Dobbins here. He's the number 21 overall prospect by MLB Pipeline. And he is the most likely candidate, in my opinion, to actually get protected. And the reason that I say that is because he's 25 years old and he actually played in AAA this last season, but he actually did pretty well. And even though it was only four games, those four games were pretty impressive, but he also pitched really well at Portland. And so when you look at a guy like this, these are the type of players that if they don't get protected, this is when organizations take a shot on him. Because really, if this is the last guy in your bullpen, I know he was a starter this whole year, but you know a lot of starters come up and they become relievers. But he, if he's the last guy in your bullpen, and you can have him out there for 40 appearances a year, 50 appearances per year, and he can come up and give you like a four and a half, five ERA, you know, you take that because you're not concerned as much about this season. You're concerned about, hey, who can this guy be in two years or three years when we can kind of develop him? And if we can pick up, you know, a nice prospect for free, basically, this is the type of person where it's like, okay, if, if he's left unprotected, he's probably going to get picked. And, you know, he's probably one of the best pitching prospects in the Red Sox organization at this point. Like, he was drafted in the eighth round in 2021 by the Red Sox, but they've done a very good job of developing him. And there is some credit that goes to the Red Sox for this because they've been very bad <laughs> overall about developing pitching over the last decade of baseball. And a big part of that is because, you know, they're just not drafting pitchers high in the draft. But again, he's a guy you're just going to want to take. I think he's a guy that if a different organization, they see he's available, he's probably somebody that I would want to take. He strikes out a decent amount of guys. He does walk too many. That's still something that needs to be kind of refined a little bit more. But at the end of the day, somebody you probably want to protect, and he will be protected by the organization, I feel. Next one on this list, we've got Alan Castro at number 19 by MLB Pipeline. And Castro was signed in 2019 for $100,000. So he's another one of those you know lower value type guys that's kind of started developing himself pretty well. And Castro is kind of like one of those forgotten players in the minor league system by a lot of people, I think. One of the things that I really like about Castro is this walk rate is great. Like 243 batting average last year at high A, 363 on base percentage though, 449 slugging for an A12 OPS. Not too bad. You know, he's got a little bit of power in him. He can hit some gap to gap shots, a little bit of speed, not too much. But he's a switch hitter. He can take a walk. He's the type of guy where, you know, at 21 years old, if he has another really nice projectable season, he could be a guy that could, you know, be a fourth outfielder on a major league team or somebody that you have off your bench or even, you know, an everyday regular. You just kind of have to see where the development takes you. But for right now, he's just started playing at double A. You know, he had just 28 games at double A, not impressive at all in this first stint, which is fine from a development standpoint. But from the standpoint of an organization wanting to have this guy on the roster all season, He's just not going to get picked. He's not even on the White Sox. They would stick him here. And so Alan Castro is not a risk to be selected. He's not going to get put on the 40-man roster to protect him. And again, I think he's just one of those guys you wait and see what you got until this next year, similar to like what Blaze Jordan's been doing. And they're both 21 years old, Blaze Jordan and Alan Castro. So I think that there's a possibility that they get added next year, but they both have to have pretty nice seasons and start making some impact at the AAA level as well. And the last one that is on this list specifically, there is another guy that I'll be talking about after this, but the last one on this list is Yostinson Garcia at number 12 overall by MLB Pipeline. Now, Yostinson Garcia, um, for those of you guys that don't know, this guy was picked up for $350,000 in 2019. He's the older brother of another pretty well-known prospect in Johan Fren Garcia. I made this big sprawling video talking about how Yostinson Garcia is potentially one of the next top prospects in all of minor league baseball. So if you haven't seen it, go check it out. I'll try to link it up here somewhere, but um, you can watch that later on. But Yostinson Garcia made the all minor league team this last year, meaning that he was named one of the three most impressive outfield prospects this last season. And you can kind of see why. Like at the high level, he almost came out of nowhere when it came to his production this year. But a 311 batting average, 371 on base percentage, 627 slugging, 998 OPS at high A, 16 home runs, 14 doubles. Like the guy just hit the ball very hard. And he's one of those very, very interesting prospects moving forward that I think 
could develop into somebody, you know, they say right here his potential is a fourth outfielder and his ceiling's an everyday center fielder. And I think he's reaching closer to that everyday center fielder spot because he's pretty solid defensively. You know, he's got strong instincts in center field. Um, and when you watch him play defensively, he definitely knows how to get to the baseball. Now, this is all great. But again, he's kind of in one of those similar type positions. It's like Alan Castro and Blaze Jordan. These guys were playing at high A and double A and just not quite performing to the level that you want to see. Like, yes, he was named one of the minor league players of the year this last year. But again, he only has 30 games at double A and he batted 263 with a 706 OPS. Like those really aren't that great of numbers. So do you want to risk putting this guy on your active roster for the whole season when he's only played less than 30 games at double A. I probably wouldn't, but do the Red Sox want to risk this type of prospect to be picked by a different team? Because he already, if he has another really solid season, he's a top 100 prospect, no doubt. No doubt in my mind. And so do you want to risk losing that with the chance that somebody might select him? I think I take the risk just because I don't think that he's going to get picked. I really don't. And if he does get picked, there's always the chance that he could be returned to you, remember? Because if he doesn't perform at the Major League level, which I think would be a stretch if he did perform at the Major League level at this point, he could always get returned to you because they just can't serviceably keep them on whatever roster he's been selected from. But overall, I would not put him on my 40-man roster to protect him. That's just, that's just me. So that kind of leaves us with just one player that I would definitely protect, and that's Hunter Dobbins, just because I do think that he probably would get selected if he, if he wasn't protected. Now, there's one more player that's not on this list that I do think has actually a pretty good shot of getting selected, and that is Michael Fulmer. So for those of you guys that don't really remember Michael Fulmer, he actually was the Rookie of the Year in 2016 for the Detroit Tigers, and he had some pretty solid seasons those first few years, and he's kind of bounced around a little bit since then. In 2023, he came out of the bullpen for the Chicago Cubs, and, you know, he was fine nothing to really stand out about he's pretty average 97 era plus and the red sox signed him to a minor league contract but it was a two-year minor league contract because he was undergoing surgery on his arm and so basically what that means is oh it doesn't actually even show it here basically what that means is he signed for this next year at one and a half million dollars but he's not on the 40-man roster because he's just been hurt he signed that minor league contract essentially just to rehab and make a little bit of money and so he's a pitcher that potentially could get selected in the Rule 5 draft because the Rule 5 draft is basically you just selecting players that are not on the 40-man roster that have accrued this service time. So like other players can get selected in the Rule 5 draft, even if they're just in the minor league system. And so why primarily this is to protect prospects, Michael Fulmer is one of those guys that is eligible to be selected. And he kind of presents an interesting case because you look at him and obviously, you know, he's established at the major league level, like a 3.94 ERA, 12.6 war. Like he's mostly been a reliever these past few years, but he's been, you know, pretty successful. And especially for a guy who teams are looking at and they're trying to add to their bullpen for this next season. He's somebody that if he can just rebound from surgery, you at least kind of know what you have. Like this is probably, you know, first or second option out of the bullpen. He can be a middle reliever for you. And you can't always bank that you're going to get a Garrett Whitlock or a Justin Slayton from the Rule 5 draft where they end up being one of those back end of the bullpen arms. Sometimes you kind of just take a guy where it's like, we need to fill out our bullpen. This guy's going to be serviceable. So it's interesting what the Red Sox will do here in the next few days if they're going to add him to the 40-man roster or not. If I'm running the organization right now, I think that you maybe don't. Because again, it's just like a risk that you kind of take. Like, yes, you paid the money to have him rehab this last year, but that's kind of like a sunk cost. He's going to make a million and a half this year, which is, you know, not a lot, but it's a little bit of money. It, you could save that money potentially and allow another team to pick it up. And again, if he doesn't stay on the active roster the whole year, he can be offered back to you. And so there's there's a bunch of different things on it. But I don't think Michael Fulmer would be like a tremendous loss to the organization if he was gone. I think you'd rather protect a guy like Hunter Dobbins, potentially. But as we talked about in the beginning of this video, there's like two roster spots potentially that they could DFA for. So if they feel like... Michael Fulmer is one of those guys. You add Hunter Dobbins, you add Michael Fulmer. Those are your two guys that you add to the 40-man roster spot. That's potentially what I would do. But you don't have to. You can keep some of these other guys. I think Bailey Horn's gone regardless. I think he's going to be gone for Hunter Dobbins' spot. But outside of it, 
That's that's basically what the Rule 5 draft will be this year for the Red Sox. It's going to be interesting to see if they're going to select anybody because the 40-man roster is full. They'd have to DFA some more guys. But, you know, Craig Breslow has made it pretty clear that he's just going to get opportunities where he's fighting them. They're being smart about who they're selecting. Justin Slayton was a great pickup this last year. So I think you give him the benefit of the doubt and you're able to trust him to make moves like this without worrying about, you know, a guy being DFA and maybe picked up by a different team off of waivers. Anyway, guys, that's the video today. Leave your comments down below. I'm interested to see what you guys have to say about the Rule 5 draft. If you guys knew some of this information already or if you guys learned something today, let me know. I appreciate all of you guys that have been joining this. I like doing this type of video. I'm going to try to do as much as I can moving forward. It's a little bit inconsistent, but basically anytime I know that there's news or there's things that we need to talk about, I'm going to be kind of talking about it. There's no like set schedule for when these are going to be done, but it is what it is. If you did like this, make sure to like and subscribe. And if you do, I will see you next time. Bye.